I got to tell you, man, he's all the way to like plus 350 in some spots right now to be the second pick of the draft, which I'm definitely going to bring up when our boy Mo Khan is going to join us in a couple of minutes because if you recall, me and Mo Khan have a friendly wager um, regarding Drake May versus be drafted ahead of Drake May. He thought I was crazy. We ended up just betting a hat, an NFL draft hat, right? Whatever team, uh, we'll see. Like, if, if I'm right or wrong, we'll, we'll, we have to buy the other one, whatever team the player was drafted by. Shout out to everybody joining us on Sirius XM Channel 159. This is Sports Rage. I am Aranci, and we're sweating out this Kansas City game. Kansas Left. I've got over 130, 130 and a half in this game. So they're at 118 points right now with 222 left. Man, I've been on the wrong side a lot of these overs, actually, over the last couple of days, specifically with the women. The men's tournament, we did pretty well over the weekend, actually. I got to, you know what, winning, basically not losing a ton of money in the NCAA tournament is a success. It just is, right? So... We actually got things going a little bit. You know what? For the most part, uh, all the teams we like, everything, a lot of stuff that we thought was going to happen, for the most part, happened. There were a couple of losses here and there that we would have liked to get. Um, The Utah State, um, not Utah. What was the pick last night? It was a bad pick. There's so many of these games. Not the, it wasn't Utah State. There was a game last night that, uh, I had major regret about <laughs> at the end. I was like, yeah, this, this was just not a good idea uh, uh, to, uh, to take this team. Oh, Yale. There it is. Yale, Yale against San Diego state. And you know what? I double clicked it. That was, I made a mistake. I like, I had a parlay with Yale at the back end and I forgot about it. I clicked Yale again, plus the points. And I was like, well, I'll wait and see how the game goes. And maybe I'll bet in game and I can figure this out. And I didn't have an opportunity to do anything because San Diego State murdered them so quickly. So I hammered the end game over, and I did win that. I escaped. But, yeah, Yale was a bad pick on the way out. But if you saw, I posted my my final four picks. We talked about them. And it was it was 90 to 1. 89 to 1 to be exact. 89-71 or something. Let's call it 90 to 1. Nine, my final four was 90 to 1. UConn, North Carolina, Houston, and North Carolina pays 90 to 1. I got in on that, and I did it again. So I've got like two hundred and twenty bucks on. You know, I've got essentially I get ten thousand dollars back if if this final four happens. We're two wins away. You know, basically I'm going to see what happens. If all four of these teams can win their next game, then I'm going to be in an interesting situation where I might have to consider like some a little bit of hedging. You know, what I'm saying like. Like a good example, like if I, the one, the two teams that I'm most concerned about, well, you know, I can't lie. I'm kind of concerned about all of them, (laughs) besides UConn, to be honest. But like if Purdue plays Houston to go, like, you know what I mean? There's there's certain matchups where I'd be like, all right, you know what I mean? Maybe I'll have to take, you know what I mean? I'll I'll take Purdue in this game just to start trying to play both sides. See, this is brutal. That's what I'm talking about right now. I got over 130. They're at 128 right now, and the girl on Kansas just missed like a little, like, she was right there. She was right there under the basket. I'm like, there's been a ton of these shots, man, today in these games. Like, I've been watching this woman's stuff all day long. I got to tell you, these numbers are freaking sharp. And another thing I'm realizing, with the exception of this Utah-Gonzaga game, there's a lot of points being scored, but most of these women's games always sort of land around the same number. 128, 130, right? Like, I've been watching these games all day. A lot of the totals have been landing right around this. And it's, not, it's been kind of a one-sided day, though, today. All right? The USC Trojans looked impressive tonight. Seven, uh, oh, oh, God. You always hear, oh, women never miss free throws. Yeah, I got muddy on them, and now they're just missing. Let's roll. Level three has begun. This is Sports Rage. I am Marantzi. The pips, the players, the hustlers, the people of Bustler, and everybody else in between. Shoy Otani denies betting on sports. Well, I admit I do bet on sports, and I'm about to go down in flames. I got over 130 and a half in this uh, USC Trojan 
Kansas women's game right now. Yeah, over 130 and a half. They're at 128 right now. And they just missed two free throws. And a girl just missed like a layup under the basket. Like, this is painful right now. So we're at 128. I need a three-point shot. They just missed another free throw. The USC Trojans have missed three free throws in a row. I could have just already won the stupid bet. All right, hit this free throw. She missed again. They missed four effing free throws in a row. Dear God. Give me a three ball here. I need a three ball. And no, they turned it over. Cads has turned it over. Unless somebody on USC takes a shot here, up 73-55 and hits a three, I'm going to lose four free throws in a row. Next time someone tells you, watch women's basketball. They they shoot well and they never miss free throws. Yeah, tell them to watch the USC Trojans. <laughs> Dear God, the girl on USC did try to take a three-point shot. She nearly shot it out of the gym. And Kansas, are you going to shoot the ball here? Come on, shoot the ball. No, Kansas walk it out. It gets to 128. They literally just missed four free throws in a row. The USC Trojans. Man, you get to like in the garbage time and stuff. It wasn't their starters on the floor, right? It really is like crazy how bad some of these like bench players are in college basketball. You see it like in the men's tournament as well. Like who's that kid on Duke? The kid that came in late in the game. <laughs> he looks he looks like he's like 14 years old. He took a free throw. He hit the front of the rim. And then the same thing. It came down to like he's got to hit this free throw. And, uh, and then he did for an in-game bet for me. All right, we got NFL, March Madness, and a lot of rage. Bring it. They have looked fantastic. That's not the team that I saw in the regular season. All those people that had all that extra time because of those COVID seasons is going to be gone, and you're not going to really have the 23, 24, 25-year-old basketball players running around anymore. You're not going to have it. Pharrell Coast to Coast, only on SportsGrid. The Bostonian versus the book. The books have so much information. Now, the, the gamblers do as well, but it's coming down to sometimes coaching, sometimes, you know, a, a good play, a good call. I mean, the block last night that was a block, it was called a foul. Oh, oh my God. My God. That was Dude, all. We would ball. see that highlight forever. Yes. And instead, oh, we, we, we got we, robbed. We'll, we'll never see it again. We got, got robbed by a referee making, you know, that's a ref. They in, still covered, though. They did. They did cover. The Bostonian versus the book. I think JMU is going to knock off Wisconsin. I think JMU, with the way that they can score the ball and spread you out, Wisconsin struggles to defend. They're in the bottom third in defensive efficiency. Iowa State's not going to beat you with offense necessarily. They're just they're just not. Illinois will beat you with offense. I like Illinois. I don't love them enough to beat UConn. you got to guard at some point. Give me Connecticut to make the Final Four. Betting above the rim. Only on Sports Grid. Sports Grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head -head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All we've heard you say on the network is you're either winning or you're rebuilding. In-game live all access. Nobody has been more profitable as a dog than Shaka Smart Team. Winning back-to-back -back road games. 
I, I don't care if they're playing Topeka High. I, I wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever. In game live, prime time. Back to back, just utterly stinker quarters. In game live, overtime. Honestly, as, as you sit here and listen, watch right now, you may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. The Monday Night Meltdown. This is Sports Rage. I am Marancy. Let's do this thing. Shout out to all of our radio affiliates. The Mighty are 1090 to 50,000 watt uh, juggernaut SoCal in the house. BSPN Radio. We're kicking it on Sirius XM Channel 159 Sports Grid Radio and Television Networks. Uh, the women's took center stage uh, today after the men uh, took center stage over the weekend. Although there was women's games going on over the weekend. Caitlin Clark played her final home game uh, tonight. Iowa wins, but they didn't cover. Uh, the uh, the point spread, but it's been nice to see uh, nice to have basketball on again all day long. We've got a reprieve until Thursday night right now. And the updated numbers: the UConn Huskies are now plus two twenty to cut down the nets and go back to back. The Houston Cougars are the second choice at five to one. Purdue is six to one. Arizona is plus eight fifty. North Carolina twelve to one. Tennessee twelve to one. Marquette sixteen. Iowa State 18, Gonzaga 22, Creighton 25, Duke 25. Duke not getting a lot of love. Um, Illinois. Illinois are a better team than to be 28 to 1. I'll tell you that. Alabama 33 to 1, San Diego State 65 to 1, Clemson 80, and NC State 100 to 1. Let's bring in Mo Khan uh, right now. TSN statistician, play by play voice, former wide receiver, meteorologist, and more. Mo, it's always a pleasure. How are you doing tonight, Mo? I am well, Gabe. Great to see you, my friend. That, that USC Kansas game has stressed out a lot of people tonight. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it was one of the late night games. A lot of money on that, and uh, under betters will be happy that the USC Trojans bench missed four straight <laughs> free throws uh, to close. It's like, come on, like seriously, four free throws in a row. I needed three points for the win at the total at 130 and a half, but it is what it is. We're on the over 143 and a half in Gonzaga. And uh, Utah. And I tell you what, this Gonzaga team, just like the men's team, this team can score and put a lot of points up on the board. We've got a high scoring game uh, here. And the um, Gonzaga women are winning 62 to 50 with um, basically the fourth quarter just started. We're about a minute into the uh, the fourth quarter. So uh, 62 50 uh, right now. So, uh, Mo, we're at Sweet 16 is set uh, right now. Which of the Sweet 16 games are you most looking forward to watching? What do you think is the best one and the one that's the, the closest and most competitive one? I think UConn-San Diego State rematch. I think that's going to be fascinating to see how UConn has going to – how they're going to fare now because let's put it this way, Gabe, right? They've had an easy first two games in the tournament, and now they get a, a stiff challenge in, in SDSU, right? And I think the Aztecs' length could be problematic for UConn. I think UConn's a better – ball team coming into this matchup here but this will be a real tre- test of how we'll be in the trenches going to this matchup uh that we'll have on thursday and friday night here so i think that's gonna be the game i'm watching out for and i think for san diego state look this is a team that will have to really win it with ball control ball possession and making sure they get quality shots on net. if they take some ill-advised shots and allow uconn to run they're gonna get punched for that so i think, think this game's gonna be more of a slow down effort for san diego state than the running gun that we might anticipate with UConn playing this type of matchup. Yeah, but this is what makes um, UConn so dangerous. They can play any style, right? If you yeah. want to get into a track meet with them, they can outscore you. But if you want to get and play fundamental basketball against them, it's kind of a problem because they don't make a lot of mistakes. They don't turn the ball over much. They've got a ton of size. I think it's a bad matchup for SDS- SDSU. I feel bad for them that they actually get UConn. But you remember, Mo. Everybody was saying before, oh, UConn have a tough, tough path there. Now you're saying, oh, well, they didn't really have to play anybody. That's why you can never, I was like, yeah, whatever. Like, oh, they're tough path. You know what I mean? It kind of is what it is. But to me, they're clearly just the best team in college basketball. Like, they really are the best team. I think there's a reason why they're only plus 220. I think San Diego State are in a lot of trouble here. I I think, look, I think San Diego State, 
no question the odds were against them, right? But but I think this it's a matter of quality shots now for SDSU, right? When you watch that game against CL on Sunday night, I mean they had like they were far superior. There's no question about that. But I just think in this situation now for UConn, they are the favorites. Them and Purdue, right? Purdue and, and UConn are on a collision course to meet up in the finals in Arizona in two weeks' time when we speak again on that Monday night. But the thing for UConn is that have they been really challenged at all? And I think in the first two games, they weren't as impressive. I think, look, at the end of the day, the first two games aren't going to define how you are for the rest of the tournament. But it sets the tone of how you'll play going towards your next round of games here. And I just think that in the situation that it is for SDSU, if they can keep this low scoring and get quality shots, Gabe, that's going to be the key, quality shots on net, they might have a chance to pull off the smash or grab against UConn late in that matchup. They might. I'm not saying it's going to be a full confident m- moment here for them. All right. Mo is uh, buying into the Aztecs. Uh, hang around. Listen, I'm a massive fan of Dutcher. This team, too. That was super impressive. Uh, they just murdered Yale and just suffocated <laughs> them from, from the onset. That was a dominant performance. But as I stated, like, you know, obviously you're going to have this this motivation from last year for SDSU. I just don't think Hurley's the type of coach that is going to let his team be overconfident coming in uh, to this game. But they are laying 11 points, everybody. But it should be noted that uh, UConn won 6-0 and last year against the spread in the uh, in the tournament as well. So UConn, 11-point favorites. Clemson would have to say, Clemson and NC State are the two bigger surprises. So I guess we could argue which yeah. one's a bigger surprise. But, uh, you know, we'll have to say Clemson. Only because NC State did win the ACC tournament. They came into this tournament hot. And here we have Clemson still playing. What do you think about Clemson against Arizona? So I think for, look, I think Clemson right now, with the way they played against Baylor, right, that first half they hit shots. And then they locked it down in the second half. I think Baylor got unlucky in the final minute of that matchup with free throws not going through for them and then kind of went off the rails for them. But I just think in this situation right now, you look at Clemson, they're kind of peaking at the right time here. But for Arizona, under Tommy Lloyd, this is the first time they've gone beyond the first weekend of games, essentially, for them. And I just think now, Caleb Love, a guy that they got from UNC through Michigan, sorry, gave through Michigan uh, to come play for them, has been a, a blessing in disguise for this Arizona Wildcat team because he's calmed down the nerves in this first two days or first two games that they had in the tournament. And I think in this situation against Clemson, though, he's very familiar with, the question is for the Tigers, can they clamp down Caleb Love and take away what he does as a maestro on the, on, on the basketball court for the Wildcats. If they can do that, they can make it a little bit twitchy for the Wildcats, but I think Arizona's going to be going to the Elite Eight, and they'll play UNC, who has a tough match for themselves against Alabama, that we'll see on the weekend coming up. I think from a betting perspective, a lot of people, you see these teams get to the Sweet 16, and people want to buy in to the underdog, but there's going to be a separation in class now. Right, I mean, this, you know, now everybody's competition is a lot tougher, and I think Clemson are in extremely tough against an Arizona team that I think we'll be able to run on them. Should be a fun game. I like the over yeah. one fifty two uh, in that game. They're all really cool games. Alabama, North Carolina, and of course, you talked about Caleb Love. He transferred. He was going to go to Michigan, yet there was some um, academic enrollment issues. So he decided to, you know, they, he ended up in Arizona. Would have made a big difference for Juwan Howard probably, uh, actually, when it's all said and done. And for the record, it was officially, uh, it's been official, Dustin May. Dusty May is the new head coach, Florida Atlantic, uh, in Ann Arbor right now with the Michigan Wolverines. But if North Carolina win and Arizona win, then we're going to have the, the Caleb Love game. Right. And the Davis game. And it's interesting because you add those two players together and it was it didn't work, which is kind of it's kind of crazy. They played together last year with North Carolina and the Tar Heels didn't have good chemistry. It just never really clicked for them. And then they split up and they're both like the conference player of the year in their conference. (laughs) So it will be an interesting matchup if it comes to this. North Carolina, Alabama. People were kind of down on Bama coming into this tournament, but when they're hitting shots, they're dangerous to play, and they played in two different style of games this week and survived. What do you think about North Carolina and Alabama in 20 seconds? I think Carolina's depth is going to be far too much, and you saw in that second half against Michigan State, they control the tempo, control the narrative in that matchup. If they get going with their shot taking in the first half of that matchup against Bama, I think Carolina should win rather easily over the Crimson Tide going towards the lead eight. 
Yeah, I've got a big parlay with North Carolina making it to the Final Four. I hope they can get there. season all those people that had all that extra time because of those COVID seasons is going to be gone and you're not going to really have the 23 24 25 year old basketball players running around anymore you're not going to have it Pharrell coast to coast only on sports grid The Bostonian versus the book. The books have so much information. Now, the, the gamblers do as well, but it's coming down to sometimes coaching, sometimes, you know, a, a good play, a good call. I mean, the block last night that was a block, it was called a foul. Oh, oh my, God. my God. That was Dude, all We would ball. see that highlight forever. Yes. And oh, instead, we, we, we got we, robbed. We'll, we'll never see it again. We got, got robbed by a referee making, you know, that's a rep. They still covered, though. They did. They did cover. The Bostonian versus the book. I think JMU is going to knock off Wisconsin. I think JMU, with the way that they can score the ball and spread you out, Wisconsin struggles to defend. They're in the bottom third in defensive efficiency. Iowa State's not going to beat you with offense necessarily. They're just they're just not. Illinois will beat you with offense. I like Illinois. I don't love them enough to beat you, Kyle. you got to guard at some point. Give me Connecticut to make the Final Four. Betting above the rim only on Sports Grid. Sports Grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All you've heard me say on the network is you're either winning or you're rebuilding. In-game live all access. Nobody has been more profitable as a dog than Shaka Smart team. Winning back-to-back road games. I, I don't care if they're playing Topeka High. I, I wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever. In-game live. Prime time. Back-to-back just utterly stinker quarters. In-game live. Overtime. Honestly, as, as you sit here and listen watch right now, you may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. This is Sports Rage, the Monday Night uh, Meltdown. We've got our eye on Gonzaga, Utah, the women's game right now. i got to tell you, this Gonzaga team, 31-3 and on the season, they've got some size uh, on their team. This is the, They're one of the bigger teams that I've seen as far as just length is concerned. I know they're not the only ones. A lot of these West Coast teams actually are pretty big and, uh, and rangy, but Gonzaga's got some size uh, on the floor that's causing Utah some problems, although Utah's going on a little run right now. It's 67-59 with under six minutes remaining. The winner advances to the Sweet 16 and plays the uh, the one seed, Texas Longhorns. Uh, we're talking uh, March Madness, women's and men's with Mo Khan uh, right now. But let's get back to the men's. I am Gabe Morenci. This is Sports Rage. Illinois and Iowa State. This is an intriguing game to me, and I think people are sleeping on this Illinois team, actually. One of the most explosive offensive teams in the country. Another team with size. Another team that's very mentally tough. They played a lot of close games. I like this Illinois team, and I was a fan of Iowa State, actually, coming into this tournament. But I think I think Iowa State's ceiling is about to hit here. I think Illinois are going to beat Iowa State in this game. 
The odds makers have this one nearly as a pick em. Iowa State are actually two point favorites. And I get it. They smashed Houston in the title game. But I think Illinois, I think Illinois' offense will be too much for Iowa State. I think they're going to be able to outscore them. And I think defensively they'll they'll do enough to to bother Iowa State here. Who do you like in this one, Mo? Who do you got? I, I agree. I like Illinois a lot in this matchup. You, you look at the team from two years ago when they were, were a high ranked team, I think they're one seed back in the bubble, whatever it was, and they were early exit, right? They reformatted their team, right? They they came out there, they got more scoring to work with, and, and they have more balanced attack from their bench play with their starting five. I think they complement each other really well. And in that first couple of games that they've had so far, the tournament, they've really impressed me with their rebounding effort as well. I think for Iowa State, you're right, Gabe, they've been peaking at the right time. I, I know they were a borderline number one seed that we conversed about last week at the seeding and pairings that they had initially. But I just wonder now if they've plateaued. And now you're going up against a very lengthy Illinois team that will be problems inside the paint for them. So I just think in this situation right now, I agree. I think Illinois is a team to watch out for. And they could go on a run themselves, Gabe, that they can get into the Final Four and maybe, just maybe, uh, make some noise at that point. So I think Illinois is definitely a good pick to look at at this point of the tournament. Yeah, you know what? And you know we're only getting two points here, but Illinois are kind of getting slept on, considering they are twenty-eight to one to cut down the nets uh, right now. NC State. So we talked about the big surprise. NC State are one of these teams have gotten hot at the right time. Right now, people are going to you know underestimate them all the time. You know, Marquette are one of these teams, very good, but they're going to play in close games, as we saw against uh, against Colorado. So similar type of number here. They're laying six and a half points. I tell you, Mo, like NC State might run out of magic here, but I'm not ready to lay seven points against them, actually. I think they can run with Marquette. It's going to be a fun game. From a betting perspective, the way to go, guys, here, I believe, is the over 150 and a half, right? I think the winner will, you know, get into the 80s. Um, yeah. I get it. Listen, Marquette, you know, when, when they're healthy, though, right, it's, it's it's all the difference in the world. They are a super dangerous team. A lot of people really like this Marquette team as a sleeper to go – to the, to the final four here, Mo. I you know I think Marquette survived this game, but I think they win by like three or four. Yeah, this is gonna be a taxing game. I think NC State's size, as we know physically, uh, has worn down teams. You think about North Carolina and the ACC tournament they had, <clears throat> pardon me, two weeks ago. Um, they wore down UNC, and UNC had no gas in the final four minutes of that game, and they pulled away. And that's been their mo, right? They want to wear down teams with the interior presence that they have, the size, the girth that they roll with. And think about the extra pass that NC State has done so far in the last seven games that they've kept themselves alive. They've always found the right spot, opening, quality shot, uh, extra pass has worked to their, to their benefit. If they can get that extra pass against Marquette, it gives them a puncher's chance going towards the second half. But I think for, the, for Marquette, for where they're at, I think this is their first Sweet 16 in almost 10 years or 11 years, whatever it is. I think Shaka Smart has a good core group to work with. You think about this team compared to last year where many thought they would have gone deeper with last year's squad. They found a right balance with what they have from the defending transition going towards the offensive end of the court. So I think Marquette definitely gets by NC State, but I think this is definitely be a grueling matchup where it might come down to the last couple of minutes of play for Marquette to pull away from the Wolfpack. Yeah, it feels like a 78-74, you know, 79-75 type, type of game. And I got to tell you, I was sort of like thinking, oh, we're going to hit this over. We're not there yet. There's 341 in this basketball game, guys. It's 68-61 right now. So they're at 129 points. Gonzaga is on the free throw line right now. And uh, there's another brick, of course. So another one of these women's games. I think this total is going to come right down uh, to the wire. Nobody's in the bonus yet either, which is kind of frustrating. But it is 68-61. So Utah aren't going to tap out or go anywhere. We'll keep our eye on this game. Gonzaga and Purdue... You know, it's kind of I kind of feel not feel bad. I don't know if that's the right way of putting it, but I think when you look at Purdue, they're sort of judged like, oh, they always choke or they've lost before, and people kind of don't look about like just how good they are or what a great year that they've had, and specifically how dominant Zach Eady has been. I mean, that was amongst the most dominant two game performance in NCAA tournament history to get this tournament started. They're obviously about their guards and the rest of the team and what they can bring to the table here. Now they get a smoking hot Gonzaga team that people didn't believe in all year, right? It's funny, oh, Gonzaga aren't as good as they used to be. That's all we ever heard from everybody all year. And here are Gonzaga right now, after lighting up Kansas, 
This is it. This is a fun basketball game in which I got to believe this is another one that's going to be a high score and track meet. Yeah, they proved me wrong, Gonzaga. I, I thought they'd be early exit, but Mark Few has gotten to this point, I think, with nine, ten years in a row, whatever it is now, under Mark Few. And I just think of Gonzaga, and it's going to come down to coaching with Painter and Mark Few and what they do for adjustments. I think Purdue's had a relatively easy run. I think Utah State was good from five minutes, and that was it. They got blown off the court. They could have won that game by 100 games yesterday if they kept the starting five out there for the Boilermakers against uh, Utah State. But I just think it, what's going to be key for Gonzaga that that Utah State couldn't do is their space in the court. How do they keep guys out there to stretch out that formation that Purdue will, th- Purdue will throw at them? Can you get Edie away from the paint and kind of hit, have him fall into traps here to open it up? And I think the quality shot making for Gonzaga will be key for them. And I think in this situation for Mark Few, he has been a tactician when it comes to in-game adjustments. I think he's the better coach coming into this game. And, and like I said, I know people picking Purdue now on how well they were in the first two matches for them so far in this tournament. But I think Gonzaga will give them a real stiff chance here. I think Gonzaga could pull off the upset over Purdue and get themselves into the Elite Eight next weekend. One of the funner games, and they're all they're all cool in their own right. But you know, you got Duke versus Houston, oh, right? Yeah. The the preppy, yuppie, Duke, Blue Blue Devils, who somehow became less hateable over the years, but this is kind of an unlikable team again, right? I guess it's Filipowski uh, that, you know, was just one in a long line of Duke players, especially after, you know, he tripped uh, Ingram. Um, you know, he pushed the fan that time. Like I said, they, they just sort of have that Duke swagger about them again a little bit. And then you get Houston. Houston's physicality against Duke. Very fascinating matchup. I tweeted out something that I saw today about Duke not winning in the NCAA tournament um, when they're the lower seed. So, in other words, basically as an underdog. When they're the lower seed, they haven't won. They're 0-5 the last five times they played as the lower seed against the higher seed in the NCAA tournament, going back to all the way back to 1994. I don't have a problem with Houston being taken to overtime. You know what I mean? Like um, A&M were a dangerous team. And yeah. and if you're Houston, it's proven. You've shown. You're battle-tested, right? Like some teams cruise all year. You see in college basketball, they they murder teams so much all year. And then they're in a close game, and they kind of panic, right? We've seen that with Gonzaga in past years, right? They're not used to being in like, wow, we got to come back. We're down six with three minutes left. They haven't dealt with that before. The Houston Cougars have been to overtime, right? They've been in close battles, and it doesn't rattle them. We've seen them. They're very good under pressure, this team. They're, they don't have a big margin for error the way that they play, but I do think that they're going to be too much for the Duke Blue Devils. I think Filipowski is going to get into foul trouble. I think they're going to frustrate them with their physicality. I just think Houston – and the style that they play are going to frustrate the Duke Blue Devils. I like the Cougars in this game. I do like the Cougars, but and it's also a de facto home game with the game being in Dallas, right? So I think they have that on their in their back pocket. But what concerns yeah, me good. about the Duke Cougars, always, though, Duke over the years they, have they, always played in Carolina or MSG. So finally, the shoes on the other foot. Well. The other teams got the home court. Yeah. But what concerns me about the Cougars is that you're up, I think it was a 13 with, what, 250 left in the game or two minutes left in the game, and then we go to overtime. You cannot let that happen. I know Houston ran into foul trouble, but if you're going to win this game against Duke, you got to kill them early in this matchup. You cannot let them linger going towards the second half here because if Duke's three-point shooting gets going, and that's where Houston had issues defending the three-point line against uh, A&M at times, that's going to be key. And also, you think about this though, Gabe, right? How many free throws did AM miss yesterday? I think it was 16, 17, right? So if they're going to put Duke at the line, a much better free throw shooting team than AM is, and they hit those free throws, Duke has a chance to win this ball game. So I think right now, how aggressive, you mentioned the point, right? The, the, the size of, of the Cougars can be a factor, but how aggressive will they be and how will they be officiated by, by the referees in that match? Will they call it tight? If they call it tight, it might favor Duke in the situation that, hey, you put this Cougar team back in foul issues going towards the second half, they might have a chance to pull off the win in Dallas. Very good point. Uh, Duke are four-point favorites. The total is 134 in this game. And then we've got Creighton and Tennessee. You know, I didn't, I wasn't in love with Tennessee coming into the tournament, but filling out the bracket, it sort of happened organically for me, where I was like, you know what? Yeah, I think Tennessee could win that game. I think they could win this game. One by one, I just sort of felt, you know, that Tennessee could make it to the Final Four. 
This is going obviously going to be a, a very competitive game, but I do think they're going to be Creighton, Mo. Uh, we'll get Mo's uh, take on the other side, and we'll hit the NFL draft and uh, more. This is Sports Rage. people that had all that extra time because of those COVID seasons is going to be gone and you're not going to really have the 23, 24, 25 year old basketball players running around anymore. You're not going to have it. Pharrell Coast to Coast only on Sports Grid. The Bostonian versus the book. The books have so much information. Now, the, the gamblers do as well, but it's coming down to sometimes coaching, sometimes, you know, a, a good play, a good call. I mean, the block last night that was a block, it was called a foul. Oh, oh my, God. my God. That was Dude, all We would ball. see that highlight forever. Yes. And instead, oh, we they, they, got they, robbed. We'll, we'll never see it again. We got, got robbed by a referee making, you know, that's a ref. In. They still covered, though. They did. They did cover. The Bostonian versus the book. I think JMU is going to knock off Wisconsin. I think JMU, with the way that they can score the ball and spread you out, Wisconsin struggles to defend. They're in the bottom third in defensive deficiency. Iowa State's not going to beat you with offense necessarily. They're just they're just not. Illinois will beat you with offense. I like Illinois. I don't love them enough to beat UConn. you got to guard at some point. Give me Connecticut to make the Final Four. Betting above the rim only on Sports Grid. Sports Grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy Sports Today. Especially in head-to-head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game Time Decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All you've heard me say on the network is, you're either winning or you're rebuilding. In-game live all access. Nobody has been more profitable as a dog than Shaka Smart team. Winning back-to-back road games. I, I don't care if they're playing Topeka High. I, I wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever. In-game live. Prime time. Back-to-back just utterly stinker quarters. In-game live. Overtime. Honestly, as, as you sit here and listen, watch right now. You may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it is, why it's happening over and over and over and over and over again. But we just saw with the USC women's game, I had over 130 and a half. They're a 128. The girl on Kansas missed like an easy layup. And then, so that was two points. And then USC missed four straight free throws to end the game. We have over 143 and a half in Gonzaga and uh, Utah. 143 it lands on. It lands at 143, and Utah let like 30 seconds tick off at the end of the game. If they just would have fouled one more time, just would have cared a little bit more at the end. And, of course, she hits a three at the buzzer, the girl on Utah, to close it out. They quit. They were down nine with like 32 seconds left. Anyone to watch it is like, you got, why aren't you fouling? Like, Matt, you know, whatever. They missed the free throws. You hit a three. Like, there's still time left. It was like Utah just hit a wall. It was like, yeah, we're done. And wow. So, of course, we end up losing by half a point. It's just the theme of the day uh, today. We got to roll with it. Uh, the Pacers are pasting the Clippers right now. We do have the over of this game. 
uh, 245 and a half. It's 127, 109 with three minutes left. Uh, in game totals 252 and a half right now. Mo Khan in the house with us. So, um, Mo, what's your final four? What's your final four? Uh, like I said, mine is North Carolina, UConn, Houston, and Tennessee. That's what it was before the tournament. I bet it. Sticking to it. What do you got in the final four? Well, Kentucky ruined my final four, right? Uh, we, we spoke about that on Thursday, Gabe. But mine's similar to what you have. I, I think Houston's going to come out of that. But I think that South region is a bit because, again, that Duke-Houston game, they get passed by Duke. I think they'll get by uh, Marquette and get to the final four. I think UNC has a good chance to get through. Uh, but Arizona will be problems for them. I think UConn has a smooth sail to go through. You mentioned Tennessee, right? I like Tennessee against Creighton. I do like them a lot. But I think Creighton has a little bit of that X factor to work in their favor here. So this give give me Creighton to pull that win, maybe against the Final Four. So I think Creighton will be my dark horse against the Final Four going towards next weekend. I think what the problem for Tennessee, I think Tennessee are going to survive that. I think where Tennessee runs into trouble is against Purdue. Right, that's that's the one like down the road where I'm like, yeah, that that could be a problem uh, for them if they have to play the uh, the Purdue ball. That's the one team, and I didn't get any action on Purdue, but I think people are sort of sleeping on them a little bit due to past uh, failures that have nothing to do with this basketball team. If anything, it just sort of could uh, motivate them. But let's get into the NFL a little bit uh, here, Mo. And I was um, I had to couldn't help but think of you. Uh, today, when I saw the reports about J.J. McCarthy uh, going second overall to the Washington Commanders. <laughs> now, obviously, at this time of the year right now, there's going to be, like, especially now, right? It kind of there was a sort of a slow period. It's After March Madness, it's going to start to pick up, right? The NFL draft talk and stuff will start to pick up. So there's all kinds of stuff out there. But your boy, Antonio Pierce, actually said, for whatever reason, the Raiders head coach said, um, you know, we've scouted the quarterbacks, and I don't see how J.J. McCarthy's not a top three quarterback, not a top three player taken in the NFL draft. The guys on the NFL Network today said that they're hearing that Washington is actually leaning towards J.J. McCarthy uh, with the second pick uh, right now. Adam Schefter dropped it. Of course, Harbaugh has been doing the rounds, talking about how he thinks he's the best quarterback in the draft. So the odds makers and the sports books listen, Mo. Like, J.J. McCarthy right now to Washington, from a betting perspective, is all the way down to, like, plus 300, plus 350. So it's not some crazy long shot anymore. What do you make of all this sudden J.J. McCarthy hype? Well, we had telepathy here, Gabe. I thought the exact same thing when I saw the McCarthy link to Washington, saying, holy bleep, this might be coming. oh, man, I'm going to have to buy Marenzi a commander's hat. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But but here's the thing, though, right, Gabe? We're now, what, we're six weeks out from the draft, okay? There's going to be a lot of smoke screens going out there, right? Pierce is trying to hype up McCarthy to hopefully have one of the other quarterbacks, whether it's Drake May or Downs, drop down a bit for them to trade up into the fourth spot or the five spot, right? You look at the Chargers, they want a quarterback to fall to their position so they can trade out of it to get themselves more picks to work with, right? So he's going to hype up his guy, J.J. McCarthy, to say, hey, he's a great quarterback. He'll go top three, top four. And hopefully the, by the football gods, the draft gods, say, hey, Drake May, you dropped to number four, number five, whatever it is, Arizona to, to L.A. So, you know what, Gabe? It's going to be that, 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 that cat and mouse game that we're going to see. It's, it's, the, it's the exact same thing that happened to C.J. Stroud last year when you and I were conversing about that, right? The whole test thing, was he, was he pouring that test thing? Will he drop to the Raiders or drop to number 10 or to number 12? And he ended up going harder than expected, and we saw what happened, right? He proved his worth. So I think in this situation now for J.J. McCarthy, for Drake May, and for Jane Daniels in particular, we know they're going to go two, three, and four. It's a question who's going to take what. And as I told you before, Gabe, and we've emphasized this point for the last three months, there will be a team, maybe the Minnesota Vikings or someone else, that's going to really fall in love with McCarthy and trade even more than expected to get him at number four, number five, or number three, whatever it is. So you know how it's going to play out, Gabe, these next few weeks here, a lot of smoke screen. But by the time we have the draft night, who's going to have the courage to pull up a trade of great proportions to get themselves potentially a franchise quarterback in McCarthy, May, or, or Jaden Downey for that matter? And for that matter. And I agree. And I think a lot of these teams are going to throw things out there to try to garner hype, right? It's in your best interest if you're you have a draft pick to get as much hype around a player. 
But with that being stated, let's look. So the Bears, the Bears are taking Caleb Williams. We know this. Yeah. And you get into Washington. Yes. I don't think Washington are trading the pick. I think they're taking a quarterback, right? I think they're seeing this and they know the future quarterbacks. Yeah, so I don't think Washington trades a pick. I think New England is in play, Mo. I think New England could potentially be in play to trade the pick, knowing that we're not really a star young quarterback away from being good. Maybe we should stockpile some more draft picks. I think the Patriots could be more open. And this is just my opinion, but I don't think the Cardinals want to trade the pick, Mo. I think that, listen, Marvin Harrison, I don't know if you saw, but the all from the Ohio State Pro Day, and there's been a lot of talk about, and it was Paris Campbell who talked about it, saying that, yeah, Marvin Harrison wants to be an Arizona Cardinal, that he's excited about being a Cardinal. I guess DeAndre Hopkins told him and his, uh, and his dad that, yeah, it's good there, and Kyler Murray's good, and he wants to be the star there. He knows he's going to get the ball. So if you're Arizona... It's not like a destination spot all the time. You know what I'm saying? I think it is a cool place to play, but it's not a destination spot. So if you're Arizona, you can't screw this up. You're paying Kyler Murray a lot of money, bro. you got to give Kyler something to work with, okay? So, and I think they like Kyler Murray for real, and I think they're actually going in the right direction. So I don't think they want to trade the pick. So the Patriots, and then, of course, then you got the Chargers, who I think the Chargers really would be open for business, so to get that, and that would swoop in on the Giants, who could, and there was a report today, Mo, that the Maras, because they behind the scenes guys, you know, Brian Dable wasn't a big fan of Daniel Jones. He's wanted to sort of, you know, and it was the Maras, the 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 owners of the Giants make all the decisions for real. Like they don't really have like when it, when it comes to the quarterback, the owner makes a decision, and it's the owner basically said, no, Daniel Jones is the guy, and word out of New York today is that they've given the blessing to draft a new quarterback with the New York Giants. They've got the six pick, Mo. So if you're the Chargers, that's that perfect spot to trade, isn't it? Like if you're the Vikings. But if you're the Vikings, what happens if you trade up to five and then somebody swoops in and trades up to three to the Patriots? Like if you're in love with one of these quarterbacks, it's going to be fascinating to see how it plays out. Yeah, you know, funny enough, I was I was reading the athletic today with their mock draft. They had Harrison Jr. going to uh, the Chargers, right? And remember, when Senior played in the NFL his rookie year, his quarterback was who Jim Harbaugh with the Indianapolis Colts, right? It's be a full circle moment for junior, Senior and Junior to play with Jim Harbaugh, coached by Jim Harbaugh at that point. But I how does he last now, the five if Arizona trades the pick only essentially? Right, right. And, and I think now, right, Monty Austin Ford is a guy that wants to accumulate picks because Arizona isn't one player away game from changing the fortunes. Not in that division, not with what they have built up right now. They're probably two years away from being competitive in the Yeah, NFC but they West. also have – they need to sell tickets, and they have a restless fan base as well. They, 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 they can't – You mentioned how – You can't just okay, keep so you, on, like, building – Like I said, you have a quarterback. You need to get him somebody to throw the freaking football to, point blank. Yeah, yeah. But here's the thing, though, right? You mentioned how cool of a place Arizona is, the city is. But ownership is piss poor. We, we know they, 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 they graded poorly in the amenities, facilities, uh, overall, you know, operational uh, uh, that they have right now in Arizona. But the thing for the Cardinals is that, look, if you're going to get – chances are you're going to get calls for that pick. You know that three quarterbacks are going to go to the top three. It's a question of who that fourth quarterback will be. Is that quarterback going to be worth maybe an extra second-round pick or an extra third-round pick that you can probably pry away from, say, the Vikings or the Raiders, whoever it is that's going to move up to number four? If you're the Chargers, you know, you got to pray that someone pulls off a of Blake Bortles and takes someone well off the board in the top four picks that ends up helping your team because your phone's going to be open for phone calls for a team that's going to want to move up. And they need to get themselves a bunch of picks on cheap contracts to offset for what they've done so far of the lack of movement, given that they've cut all these guys and let go of these playmakers on offense to help get themselves back in cap shape. I do think that, like I said, I don't believe the Cardinals will trade the pick. I think the Chargers will trade the pick. Um, I understand, listen, you could argue the Cardinals need to build draft capital. There's no no disputing that. But as They're I stated, players, they, have a, they have a – they're, you know, what I mean, people don't like. It's not like, oh, they're the rabid fan base or anything like that, but it's waning. Like, they're anytime you look at the crowd in Arizona game, they just look sad. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, 
it's just sort of a depressed <laughs> no it's true like it's a bunch of fam like you know what i mean like they go to the games and they're always hurt they know it's always oh next year next year you can't tell them next year forever and eventually when you you know you get these good players and in, in the draft you got to draft them right you can't you know sometimes moving down doesn't pay off but you could argue i could totally understand the argument that hey listen if we trade it down to 9 or 11 we'll get roman dunze right or we'll get you know i don't think malik neighbors will still be there no, I don't think That's so. That's the other one, too. A lot of people are pushing that neighbors can go before Harrison. I'm not fully buying it, but a plus 500 on the book, it's worth a bet, I think, Mo. Yeah, but it's, again, Gabe, it goes back to the point of the quarterback, right? They're trying to downplay Harrison Jr. Oh, no pro day. No, this is the new age player prospect, right? They're controlling their narrative. They're going to control the storyline for what Yeah, they but his do. stock really hasn't moved one way or the other. He's always no, been sort hasn't. of locked in as the first non-quarterback taken. Absolutely right, and again they're just saying, "Hey, look what he wait, look what he did not do the last month. No pro day, no combine work. He's got to drop down, so we take him." Right? It's again, it goes back to that smokescreen uh, bullcrap being thrown out there by teams in range six to ten that want to get themselves a quality player because if they can get themselves a Marvin Harrison Jr. at number six, number seven, it's a home run. You think about it, if you're the Chicago Bears and you got Dunze and neighbors, who knows, and Harrison Jr. at that point, you can think about number nine for sure. But I think right now it's all smoke screen. They want to have guys drop down the board and they take them at their benefit. But the one guy I'm looking at, and I know we talked about the, the big hitters on the offense, is Dallas Turner, who I think is probably the best defensive impact player that we'll have in this draft that will go in the top ten. If the Falcons get him number eight, I think the Falcons' defense becomes even more dynamic with Dallas Turner on that team. So I think there's so many storylines to look at, which I'm excited for, as we get closer and closer towards the draft. Yeah, I do think that he will be the first defensive player taken, actually, too, uh, yeah. Dallas Turner. You know what, though? There are some people, it's not just sort of the media and stuff, there are some people that think that Malik Neighbors is more explosive than Marvin Harrison. Yards after the catch, explosiveness and stuff. Right, so I'm not saying it's true, but I'm saying I think some people actually do believe that. Thanks, Bo. Always got it. They have looked fantastic. That's not the team that I saw in the regular season. All those people that had all that extra time because of those COVID seasons is going to be gone, and you're not going to really have the 23, 24, 25-year-old basketball players running around anymore. You're not going to have it. Pharrell Coast to Coast, only on SportsGrid. The Bostonian versus the book. The books have so much information. Now, the, the gamblers do as well, but it's coming down to sometimes coaching, sometimes, you know, a, a good play, a good call. I mean, the block last night that was a block, it was called a foul. Oh, oh my God. My God. That was Dude, all. We would ball. see that highlight forever. Yes. And instead, oh, we, we, we got we, robbed. We'll, we'll never see it again. We got, got robbed by a referee making, you know, that's a ref. They in, still covered, though. They did. They did cover. The Bostonian versus the book. I think JMU is going to knock off Wisconsin. I think JMU, with the way that they can score the ball and spread you out, Wisconsin struggles to defend. They're in the bottom third in defensive efficiency. Iowa State's not going to beat you with offense necessarily. They're just they're just not. Illinois will beat you with offense. I like Illinois. I don't love them enough to beat UConn. you got to guard at some point. Give me Connecticut to make the Final Four. Betting above the rim. Only on Sports Grid. Sports Grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. Pro League Soccer, powered by Marca. 
I would be willing to bet the under two and a half goals. Fantasy sports today. Especially in head-to-head formats in fantasy, I think I'm going to go with Juan Soto. Game time decisions. People don't like it. I don't really care. I cannot believe anybody is betting the Clippers at this number. Betting above the rim. All we've heard you say on the network is you're either winning or you're rebuilding. In-game live all access. Nobody has been more profitable as a dog than Shaka Smart team. Winning back-to-back road games. I don't care if they're playing Topeka high. I, I wouldn't give them any chance whatsoever. In game live. Prime time. Back to back, just utterly stinker quarters. In game live. Overtime. Honestly, as, as you sit here and listen, watch right now, you may want to consider uh, placing that bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. This is Sports Rage. I am Rancy. Word of the three-minute warning uh, right now. If you weren't with us earlier, we gave uh, out a couple of Major League Baseball futures. We talked about the divisions. We'll get into it uh, once again tomorrow and on Wednesday before uh, first pitch. But, we, you know, we were pretty kind of pretty chalkish for the most part, right? The Atlanta Braves are big favorites to win the National League East. They're like minus 280, but I do think they're going to win the East. The Dodgers are big favorites to win the West. They're going to win the West. Right, if you parlay them together, it's minus one sixty-seven. One underdog we took a longer shot: the Cincinnati Reds at plus three fifty to win the National League Central. A win total that we threw out there earlier tonight as well. That I do like the Pittsburgh Pirates over seventy-four and a half. Pirates have a lot of young studs on this team. They've been stockpiling big-time draft picks uh, for a couple of years. And I think this team is ready to become a competitive team. There's sort of a changing of the guard going on in this division where I think the Reds are going to compete for the division title. And I think the Pirates are going to be a 500 type of team. And their win total is 74 and a half uh, only. American League, surprised that the Orioles aren't favorites to win. The American League uh, East, the Yankees are actually favorites. And people in New York don't even think the Yankees are going to win. So I don't know who the hell's betting the Yankees to win a division. Uh, the Orioles, plus 200 to win a division, fair price. Uh, the the Twins are the best team in the Central, right? So I think, I think the Twins are going to win the Central. And if you get into the um, the American League West, that's going to be a fun competitive division with Seattle, Houston, and Texas. I know Texas have some injuries with the rotation, but I think the Rangers, they've shown the Rangers are willing to spend money. So I think the Rangers can only improve as the year goes on. They're a dangerous team. I'll take the Rangers to win the division in the American League West. All right, so unfortunately, there's no basketball, no women's basketball uh, tomorrow, but you got CIT, CBI. There's always, it's like, it's always happy hours somewhere. For the record, we did hit that over with the Pacers and the Clippers over 245 and a half. Thanks to Matt George and Master Control. Uh, the saving countdown to the Sweet 16 is on. We'll be all over it tomorrow night. Other than that, you're on your own. Later. Later.